most important subject that we could ever personally study is our personal salvation. How God has revealed himself through the gospel and through Jesus Christ, that we come to realize that I can be saved from my sins. My question is, is it a cooperative matter? God does his part, man does his part. I'm sure you've been taught that, but some people haven't. It's all God's part after all. Doesn't Ephesians 2, 5 say that by grace we've been saved? That's God. And yet in that same context in verse 8, before he's finished with talking about our salvation, you're saved by grace through faith. Do you see God's part and do you see man's part there? God's grace, it's all about him. I don't deserve a thing. We don't deserve anything from him. We deserve to die and go to hell. But by his grace, we're saved. It's about him. But it's also about how we respond to that word of grace. We have a part in that if we are going to be saved. And yet some people believe that in their salvation, they are just acting out a miracle. You really don't have any free will. If God chose you to be saved, you will be saved. And you're just in this miracle that's taking place with me believing, with me remaining saved. And I'm just in a miracle. I'm acting out in a miracle. Yes, I do these things, but I'm just an actor in this miracle called salvation. What does the Bible say about God's part, our part? Is it all about God? That even when we believe, it's not our free will in the matter. We just believe because God chose that would happen. It's his power. Or is it that God does his part in bringing the gospel? And we are saved when we respond to that gospel in obedience of faith. I believe it's the latter but I want us to take us in on a journey to understanding some scriptures, what happens after we have obeyed the gospel. God doesn't just leave us alone, does he? No, I'm acting out a miracle, some would say. Are, are we acting in accordance with God's word so that we remain saved and we'll go to heaven after a while? That's, those are the questions I have before us, and I think the Bible makes it pretty plain. But let's do a little Bible study for just a moment. Let's go to our Bibles in Romans the 8th chapter in verse 13. And we know that if we are going to follow after the flesh, the first part of Romans 8, 13, then we're going to die. If we're going to follow after the flesh, we are going to die. But, here's where we pick up. But if by the Spirit... Ye put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. What are you doing? I'm putting to death the deeds of the body. Oh, you're doing that yourself? All by yourself? Oh, you may be putting to death, but who's behind it? If by the Spirit ye put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. I'm looking at that as something I do. I put to death the deeds of the body of the body. And perfectly as that is, that's my job. That's my work in remaining saved so I can live. And it's by the Spirit that I realize I get my information from. See if this is not the, the point in this context. Because we see in Romans 8 and verse 14 through 15, he gives an explanation of what he just said. For, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For, further explanation, you receive not again the spirit of bondage again. You receive not the spirit of bondage again. When was I in the spirit of bondage? When I was under the old law. See, that's a context, a broader context that we'll put together in just a second. But he said, not the spirit of bondage again into fear, but the spirit of but, I, but we receive the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Whenever you see a far, you can take it backwards and say, therefore. We cry out, Abba, Father, because we have received the spirit of adoption 
Therefore, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Therefore, we're going to put to death the deeds of a body and shall live. Therefore, but by the Spirit is where it all starts. So this idea, I'm not going to be in bondage again because I'm under another system. This is what we see back in Romans, the seventh chapter, verse six. But now you've been discharged from the law. So you serve in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Is he not talking about the newness of the spirit? Capital S. Because the Spirit has been given the gospel, which we are led by, not forced to do, but led by in Romans 8 and 14 and 15. And we serve in newness of the Spirit in this gospel. We are children of God. And we can cry out, Abba, Father, a close, tender relationship with the Father. We're not under bondage to sin. Because through the gospel... We have learned the message, heard the message, and we responded to it. We receive, not the spirit of bondage again, because we're saved. Why? We're under a new law, not in the oldness of the letter, that which was written down upon stones. I think in this context, chapter 7, chapter 6, he's emphasizing that by the fact that we're not under the old law, we can now respond and when we respond to the gospel and led by the Spirit, we're sons of God. And then we indeed are going to put to death the deeds of our body and remain saved. That's something we do in response to what God has provided for us. We see this principle all through the New Testament. But this morning, I want us to see in Philippians 2, 12 and 13 that, were read, that was read for your hearing. That Paul is encouraging the people to be obedient, as it has been in his presence much more now. It's serious because I'm going to be gone. Much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God who worketh in you, both to will and to work or do after his good pleasure. Are you just an actor? In this miracle, God's touching you, and he's working in you the miracle. Now you work it out, and really, you're just an actor in this big miracle of salvation. Or is it really serious that I can use my free will to obey? Paul's writing to people, obey. Why do you have to tell them obey if it's impossible for them not to? They had to obey. Because he's, he's trying to reach their heart. And realize it's serious. God has worked in you both to will. Why do I want to serve the Lord? Because he saved me. He loved me enough to save me. Why do I want to do his will? Because he saved me. And I'm going to do it after his good pleasure. I'm led by his spirit through the gospel. That to me makes sense. And it's not the idea he's uh, working for us and doing all the, all the work. But we're working with God. Work out your own salvation. That sounds like personal responsibility to me. What about you? That's something I aim to do. Because as God is working in us, I'm saying we're working together as we strive to remain saved. I want to show us, I want to show from the scriptures how that works this morning. First of all, when we think about working out our salvation, it starts with believing. And we see in Romans 10 and verse 17 that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ or the word of God. In order to understand that in the context of the question we're asking, we go back to verse 6. Where we read here what, what God has done and that why this gospel is available to you and me. In verse 6, from Moses writeth that the man that doeth the righteousness which is of the law shall live thereby. But the righteousness which is of faith, see, is faith in someone else. Not just me, faith in someone else. It's not a faith, it's, it's not a righteousness because I kept the law perfectly. You had to to be justified under the law of Moses. But now, imperfect man can be saved 
but the trust is at the faith, the righteousness of faith. Say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven because the object of our faith is Christ. Bring him down. Or go to the abyss and bring Christ up from the dead. We don't have to do that. Why? We've got a message. We've got something that's called the gospel that is there. So in verse 8, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee. In thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. So that good news of salvation produces faith in us, but we're preaching it. It's accessible. That's what he's saying. Don't you think that you, you got to bring Christ down or bring him up? No, he's, he's been raised from the dead. He's up in heaven. He's given a word. Paul's preaching it and people are believing it. Now, let's continue. Because if thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus is Lord... And believe in the heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What do you do? What do you do? I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Where did you hear that? Let's bring Christ down here. And say, no, oh, I've got the gospel. Don't have to do that. I'm doing the believing. I'm doing the confessing. Based upon what God has brought. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's our topic. For the scripture said, whosoever believeth on him shall not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. Everybody can be saved by the same, on the same basis. He is Lord of all and rich unto all upon th that call upon him. Now he goes to the next part. Not only will you not be ashamed, but whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Our topic, salvation. How then shall they call on whom, him whom they have not believed. How should they believe on him whom they have not heard? How should they hear without a preacher? So let's fulfill some other scripture. That indeed, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring glad tidings of good things. I'm bringing you the gospel. That's God's part. And now do you respond by believing, confessing, Realizing God says you'll never be put to shame. You will be called upon my name on my authority to save you. Not yourself, but on another. You can be saved in your faith in him. But they did not all hearken to the glad tidings. Isaiah 53, 1, that speaks about the coming of Jesus Christ. They don't believe our report. Lord, who hath believed our report? So, belief comes by hearing. Not just hearing the message. Verse, four, verse before this, they heard it. They didn't believe it. No, I heed it. I heed it. I actually heed the message. I hear it. God, you've done your part. Now I'm going to respond. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Paul praised the Thessalonians because they received the word from being from God. It's the word of faith. They received it as being not man's word, but God's word. So I'm seeing God bringing the gospel. We are accessible to that gospel. But we do the believing. We do the confessing. We do the calling upon the name of the Lord. Am I, am I just an actor in a miracle? Or have I used my will? No, nope, you really did. He willed you to do that. Or as I'm using my will, because some people heard the, heard the good news, heard the report, and they didn't believe. Does that mean they had no place to, in salvation of God? He just said, hurry, he's the Lord of all, Jew and Greek. Everybody, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I think it fits well and fits better. The fact, no, God's doing his part. I'm working with his plan for me to be saved. Putting to death the deeds of the body, deeds of the flesh. I'm hearing the gospel so I can be saved. We do the believing. Except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. We're going to die in our sins. One exception, if I believe that Jesus is deity, I am, then we won't die in our sins. But we do the believing, don't we? That's something we do based upon what we see uh, the confidence that we have in Jesus Christ. Saving works through our obedience. We obey 
because we believe. That's what we see in Philippians, the second chapter and in verse 12. I want you to obey in my absence as you've been doing in my presence. James, the second chapter, verse 17, Abram is being justified by his works there. Why? Because he's emphasizing not works of law, but works of obedience. God told him to sacrifice his son. Where all the blessings were going to come from. Hebrews tells us he felt like, well, God can raise him up because he's going to fulfill his promise. But he did that. He was justified by his works. Notice this, that his works, they indeed were working with faith, not against it. It's working with faith, bringing faith to perfection, completion. Because without works, faith is dead. It doesn't accomplish that. I don't know if you're scared of flying. Some of you are just white knuckles if you ever get on it, on a plane. You may have good reason for that. But I know some that they're never going to get on a plane. And they say, well, I know they go to school and they train. Some of them have been pilots in war and situation. They can flip the plane, all that sort of thing. I, I know, I know, I, I trust them that they could probably get there all right, but uh, I'm not riding. I'm not flying because I got a car and I will drive. You go ahead because I, I think you're going to make it. You may have faith, but one day you get a call that a very close loved one has died and you need to be at their funeral. Time and space forces you. Are you going to be at that funeral? Yes, I am. Looks like today you're flying. And you may not want to be that. They may have to give you medicine and you may have a hard time, but you'll probably be on that plane. Trusting what you always said would happen. They get me there, but you never got on it. That day, your works completed your faith. And you got to your destiny. See, the problem is there's no other way to go to heaven but by Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to the Father except by me. You have no choice. Either you're going to be lost or your faith is going to be there that it says, I will obey. I will take that step in obedience. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that disbelieveth shall be condemned. Why did he say disbelieve and not be baptized? He didn't have to. Because you're not going to respond to the message that you don't trust in. The pilot says, fashion your seat belts. You're going to do it. You're going to comply with all the conditions. Because this day, I'm really going to test, do I really believe or not? And you trust it. And you have your personal salvation getting <coughs> to the funeral on time. There's no other way to salvation to Christ. We're doing our part in believing and obeying. God has done his part in sending his son to die and resurrect him. So we don't have to pull him down and say, what is the message? We got the message. I've got to do my part. Work out your own salvation. And that starts with believing because the gospel is for all. But only he that believeth and is baptized should be saved. That's what Jesus said. Secondly, we're going to work out our own salvation as Christians because we're going to learn to stand and withstand the wiles of the devil. In the context of Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18, we see in 10 and 11 that we're, we're to put on the armor of God. But we're to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. It's not about us. What is God's part? We're to be strong in connection with the Lord. We're going to work with the Lord. The Lord's working with us. But we're going to be strong in the Lord. And we're going to be, have the strength in His power. His might, not mine. His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
I've got to put on that armor. If I go out and fight the devil and fight temptation based upon my wisdom, my willpower, my knowledge, and am I 16, 17, 18 years old, don't have the experience of life, I can fall in so many pitfalls, but I'm reading Proverbs. See, I'm reading Proverbs, and I'm learning how to be wise when I'm 16. Because I've got God's armor on. That's why we teach our children the Bible early. Because we want them to be able to stand and when they are, after they become Christians, they need to fight the devil still. And he gives us the ability to stand. It is a spiritual armor because it's a spiritual foe. It's not flesh and blood. If so, we can fight them, huh? Get our guns. No, it's spiritual warfare we're dealing with. And so we have a spiritual foe. Your, your battle's not against flesh and blood, said in verse 12. Because the host of wickedness, where are they? They're the unseen heavenly places. It didn't say in heaven, but in heavenly places. That spiritual realm is full of wickedness too. Not just God's angels. There's the battle. And it's spiritual and in its nature. We're the ones that put on the armor of God, and you look at that full armor, all of it is involved with the gospel. That's the only way we can put on a breastplate of righteousness. Because that's what's found in the gospel, our plan to be righteous. God's plan for us to be righteous. That's where we get the shield of faith. We're ready to preach that gospel of peace. We're able to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's our armor that we're placing on, but it's all connected. Every one of those pieces of armor are connected with one aspect of the gospel. God delivered that. I didn't think it up. Man didn't think it up. He did his part. And so we have started becoming a Christian. We had enough sins out of our failure to live a perfect life. But devil's not finished, is he? So we learn to stand, and we stand because God has done his part to make us strong. But will we put on the whole armor? And will we fight the battle? Because in verse 13, you withstand the devil, and after you finished, you can stand. See, the battle's fault. I stand to withstand. I mean, I withstand in order to stand. We're not just clothing ourselves with armor like we clothe ourselves in cowboy time during the rodeos and so forth. We look like cowboys, don't we? No, we're, we're real soldiers in this battle. And this armor is real. It keeps us strong. It keeps us how we, how we should go. But not only that gospel, we connect that with also prayer. Praying in the spirit. Let's not talk about miraculous jargon that people would talk. I'm in the spirit. I'm praying. No, it's praying in accordance with what the spirit has said of what we should pray for. Of what is his will. And we pray that our, ourselves and our brethren in this context will be strong. And that we'll watch and pray God, we need your help. Help us get through these situations. In James 5, 16, the, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much in its doing, and it's working. Who's praying? A righteous man is. How do you become righteous? Not based on his own. It came from the gospel, and he's striving to, striving to live that life of righteousness. So we have the armor that God has provided. Put it on. And go to battle. Like get on that plane and make faith perfect. You fight the battle. And you'll be able to withstand. And having done all, stand. Thirdly, we'll work on our salvation because we're going to be doing that which is good in our life. It's important because I want to take you to the judgment. Second, Second Corinthians 5.10 We shall all be made manifest for the judgment seat of Christ. We will be raised on that judgment seat and we can't hide. 
I've been in the presence of little boys this week and, and in a restaurant, you know, we, we stayed a long time. They, they think they can hide under the table. And I've seen one little boy, like he was, he holds on to the bars of the chair and he's hidden and he doesn't think anybody can see. Well, I didn't see, <laughs> but mom and dad did. Get out of there, we gotta go. But he thinks he's hidden. He's playing his games. There's no games with God and judgment. We can't sit there and hide beside some, about someone else. It's a personal, individual manifestation. Here we are before the judgment seat of Christ. To receive the things that he has done, not they, what he has done in the body, whether it be good or evil, good or bad. I think we want to be the ones that are doing good. Well, how does that start? The gospel revelation. All scriptures given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine. I, I know that. That's by which I'm saved. But it's there for reproof, for training in righteousness. He told me how to live. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished to do his work unto every good work. Every good work. And I know what's good. And I train my mind and I train my life to be one who is indeed not a babe in Christ any longer. But I'm growing in the faith and I have my senses exercised. Not that I had good theology and I, had, I read my Bible. I know what it says. No, I put it to use. And I put it to use so I can discern good and evil. Not well, I know the difference between good and evil. No, I know what's evil and I know what's good. He's not saying contrast there. I know good and I know evil. Why? Because I got the Bible. You have the scriptures. But we've got to be in the game, don't we? We're, are we just an actor in a thing called a miracle called salvation? But are we awake and alive and sensitive? And we exercise our senses because we take the Bible and we apply it in our lives. And we can discern good. And we can discern evil. And therefore put them there in contrast and I can tell you which is which. But I have to exercise. You can have all the treadmills. All in every room just in case you just want to be reminded everywhere I need to be doing this. And you can exercise Six, seven days a week. You can have that opportunity to do so, but if you don't do it, it'll never help you. I wonder how many exercise equipments have been put on the curb through the years. Brand new, cost a lot of money, but they soon get out there on the curb, don't they? Well, that's because I wore it out. Yeah. No, I got tired of the roaring machine. Well, we'll try something else. You can have it. And that, that happens. But we, 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 don't, we, we don't stay with it. We got to stay with this. Our salvation is that important. And by doing good, we realize we are God's workmanship. It's not about us in Ephesians 2 and verse 10. That we should glory. We are God's workmanship. Created for what? That we would do the good works. He gets the glory. But we are involved in doing the work. Again, it's something important because in the judgment, we're going to see how important evil and good and good and evil is. Because there's going to be a resurrection in John 5, 28 and 29. We're all going to hear the Lord's voice. Everybody's going to hear it. And they're all going to come from, from the tomb. And those who have done good and evil, it will be very important. Because in verses 28 and, and 29 of John 5, we read, And shall come forth, and they that have done good under the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil under the resurrection of judgment, condemnation, cast into the 
lake that burneth with fire and brimstone, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, where you no longer have any hope. No hope. There's no end to eternity. And so doing good right now should be very important to us. And we should be thinking about that very seriously. But how do I know what's good in a world that's turned upside down? Am I only going to look at sin? What harm does it do the other person? That should defend homosexuality, by the way. What harm do I do to grown-ups think about what, what harm to do you? We live in a society where pedophilia is not that bad to people. The world continues to corrupt and get worse and worse. And I have got to discern, and I know last no, that's wrong. <laughs> Sexual immorality is wrong. Even between two people who don't have a right to one another. You keep yourself focused. And you do that which is good. In order to, from what the scriptures teach. And I'll tell you one thing that is good is this final point, is that we further the gospel. Back to Philippians, the second chapter. This is our passage in the context. We pick up at verses 14 through 18, where it was important, as God works in us to will and to work for his good pleasure, we realize this has a part of that saving gospel where people can hear of God's grace. But in verses 14 through 18, we're the ones that become a light in this world. We're holding forth that word of life. And Paul is stressing how important that is, that he would not have run the race. He'd run a race without victory if these people are lost. So salvation was very, very important. But again, it's God working in us. The salvation to go out and try to save souls. Where does that come from, that desire and will? It's God who cares about, about souls. But we have to work it out. We have to be led by that kind of direction for our spirit to be engaged. Here's the grace of God. Here's how Paul, he distinguished himself from the other apostles as being not worthy. He, he was out there killing Christians. Jesus' apostles were Christians. And that's what he was doing. I persecuted the church of God. I'm not even meet to be called an apostle. But he distinguishes himself from them. And then he unites them all together. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's not me. It's God's grace that made me what I am, Paul says. And this grace which was bestowed upon me was not found vain because I'm going to respond. Paul is saying this to us. I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Please mark that. Well, the grace of God which was in me. Yeah, it was in him. He felt it. He understood it and he felt it. To the point I'm not even meek to be called an apostle. God's grace called me, I am what I am. But I labored more abundantly than they all, the other apostles. Not me, but the grace of God which is with me. He's working with me. That's the thought. So close accompanied by me, I never forget who I am. And if one for his grace, that'd be nothing. But it makes you want to go to work. We're not an apostle, but that same point could be made for all. We all need God's grace. And because I can be saved, people I know that are lost can be saved. I don't want to have to go to their funeral and realize I never told them about the gospel. I got on this plane to make sure I got there. They're one of my closest friends. And I never talked to them about the gospel? No. We're going to be taking care of that too. Because we want to further the gospel. 
And that's exactly what Paul was involved in doing in all, all of his life. In 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, we read this is what God's designed for us to do. Verse 3 says, This is a good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. How can they be saved unless they hear? And that's going to need the preacher. That's going to be needing you and me, the teacher, so they can come to the knowledge of the truth. And therefore, they can respond to the gospel as we have. So what are we? Philippians 2, 14, 15, we are lights in this world. We are luminaries. We are shining the light of Christ in a dark world of sin. And if you feel despondent about how dark and wicked this world is, just think how bright your light is as a Christian. This is a time to shine. Now say, I thank y'all put me under the table for a while. It's pretty tough out there. No, it's time for us to shine. And we don't have to bear arms. We don't have to, we just go live the life of a Christian based upon principle of the gospel. God can use you. And we're extending forth that word of life to people. Extend it, not ashamed of it, extending it. And we have a life that's striving to live by the examples that we should live so they can see our light and glorify the Father who's in heaven because it's all about Him. He does His part. We're doing our part. And this is the part of remaining saved because this helps us. When I start not having a love for souls, I might not have a love for my soul either. And we get weak and we fall away. This was Paul's glory. This was Paul's race. This is the way he thought about his life. Look at Philippians second chapter verse 16 with me. Holding forth the word of life that I may have whereof to glory in the day of Christ. When I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I can glory in you, brethren, that I did not run in vain, neither labor in vain. Because y'all didn't want to stand that word. You didn't want to try to teach others. And to the point that he will rejoice in being put to death for their faith. It becomes a mutual bond too. Look at verses 17, verse 17 and 18. If I'm offered upon the sacrifice and the service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. And in the same manner do you also joy and rejoice with me. What's he talking about? I'm dying for the faith. I'm dying for the gospel that I preach to you people in Philippi. And he will. In 2 Timothy, he will. But he is just, I'm okay. I'm just a drink offering over the sacrifice of your faith. If you have not responded to the gospel, Philippians, with this faith that continues after you have obeyed the gospel... I've run in vain. I will have joy if I'm put to death on the sacrifice of your faith. And you and I should have that mutual bond with Paul and with ourselves. We sing a song, like 265 in the big book, Faith of Our Fathers. When you sing all the verses, you'll sing about our fathers. They were in dungeons. Oh, if their children could share the same fate, that they would die. That they would die for their faith. Oh, that the children. Our fathers did that. We come up as children. Will we joy and that we die the same fate that they had? And experience that death. We've seen that. Let's make it more personal. What about would you rejoice if your children died for the faith? Will we rejoice? Yeah, we shed tears. But there's that inward part of salvation. We will not be ashamed. And we can die for the glory of the gospel. We've got to get our minds set up on that. When we do that, Paul, 
I thank God for you. And I thank you for dying for the cause that allowed me to hear the gospel. And we rejoice with you as you die for the cause of Christ. Paul said, that's, that's the attitude we ought to have. Because there's nothing more important. I ask you, are we furthering the gospel? Are we like Timothy, Philippians 2, 20 and 22? I have no man like-minded, he says. Verse 21, for they all seek their own things, not the things of Christ. They go about doing their own things, but not Timothy. You know that the proof of him that as a child serveth the father, as he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel. Are we going to work together as God's people here and further the gospel where we can? I hope so. You know what? That, that is just an element of we're responding to God's grace and that will help keep us saved. Because we are focusing in upon how precious souls are. So this morning, God has done his part in giving us the gospel. We do our part by believing, meaning not just hearing it, but putting it into practice. God has given us the gospel that we arm ourselves with along with the admonition that we need, the exhortation that we need to pray. You put those two things together. Thank you, God, for your part. I'll withstand, and at, by your grace and your power, I will stand. After I withstood the devil. And I will learn from that gospel things that in my life I need to be doing that will be doing good. I'm going to be discerning good and evil. I'm going to exercise my senses of what I study. I'm going to put these things to practice in my life. That when the resurrection comes, I want to be a part of that that, were, that did good under the resurrection of life. It's personal. I know that. Thank you, God, for reminding me of that in 2 Corinthians 5.10. It's sobering. But regardless of what the world does, I can do good. I can be saved on that last day. And I want to be busy furthering the gospel. That's the best good I can ever do for someone. And what you can do for someone is helping them see the gospel and encourage them as they continue that life as a Christian. It's serious. Because God is working in me both to will and to do According to his good pleasure, I will reverence him with trembling. This is a serious matter we're talking about this morning. About working out our own salvation. And I'll leave you with what the passage we looked at, what Jesus says. You've got a part to do. If you haven't obeyed the gospel yet, if you may believe who Jesus is, we have all things ready to assist you. But Jesus says, here's the gospel. You go preaching to all the, the world. It is a gospel that's going to save people. But he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. No one can do that for you. But the gospel can move you. Thou need to do that. And we're here to assist you because we want to further the salvation to the gospel. So let's all work together. Don't put it off. Obey the gospel as we stand and as we sing.